Last time we talked about, um, you know, being in um, that, that's sort of one of the, the main themes of Daniel is the fact that he is in Babylon and that Babylon is a bigger idea in the Bible than just, um, um, than just it being a city, you know, in the Middle East somewhere that is now just kind of like in, in ruins. It's sort of a a tourist attraction with not much more than the train stop, you know. Um, but that Babylon, uh, um, you can go back and see that video if you, you missed it last week. But that it's it's a huge idea in the Bible, and that the that things start other places and other situations start getting named Babylon. And in short, really, what it is is that all of humanity is in exile, um, and even coming back from Babylon, coming back from um, the Persian exile, um, the Israelites realized that, hey, we're still, we're still, in, um, we're still in exile because you know, we, we still have another empire that's over us that went all the way into Rome. And um, it was never that they, they never had a king anymore, but it was beyond that. that it's, it's start, if you look closely at the Bible, it just shows that humanity is an exile period. Um, all of us. And so actually, I'm kind of jealous of, uh, I forget, I don't know who um, made this uh, um, title, but I love that the book of Daniel when Babylon is home. And you see here a little bit of the depiction of what Babylon's like, but then you see the city. And, um, and really what it is, is that um, Babylon, if you would um, boil it down to maybe like one statement of what it is, and I and um, I got this from Bill Randalls. He said that Babylon is is man's uh, org man's organization against or without God. That his um you know it's it's the governments that that we make. It's the things that we we do on our own, and the the way that man is collective as as. Uh, humanity run things um, without God or even in the face of God or even against God. So just to kind of give you um, sort of a footing of where the, the story of uh, Daniel takes place, I'm just going to kind of run through a little bit of the history, just, just real briefly. Um, and I called it from ba Bavel to Bavel. Bavel is the Hebrew name for Babylon. It's also what we translated into um, Babel. So the Tower of Babel, of course, is Babylon. It's the Tower of Babylon in the Shinar Plain. And it's, um, and it's really kind of in the middle of Genesis, things have devolved again and again after the flood to a place where man is trying to make a name for himself and trying to reach up to the heavens and, and um, and try, and it says that it's in the face of God, or it's it's before God. So it's it's man trying to make a name for himself on his own terms. And what God does is that He scatters them um, and causes confusion. Uh, Bavel in Hebrew sounds like confusion, and that's why we we translate it in in English as Babel because it sounds like us, you know, somebody babbling or you know making no sense or whatever. Yeah, it's an automatopoeia, and it's kind of like a, um, and so I think, you know, kudos to the English translators for kind of catching onto that and using it, because that's kind of like what you would have done in Hebrew anyways, kind of use a, a word that sounds like something and then uh, kind of capitalize on that. The, the only problem is that some people don't realize that it's the Tower of Babylon, and so that when you get to the story of Babylon, you don't realize that, hey, you're back at the Tower of Babel. You're back of where, where that all started, right? So, the, so we've been here before. yeah, we've been here before. So it's kind of like they're scattered from there. All these, all these nations get scattered with their own languages, their own tongues. And, um, and out of that confusion and out of that scattering, God decides that he's going to start a a nation, a nation of his own. And what he does is that he chooses a guy named Abraham all the way from this Ur of the Chaldees, which if you look at it, it's in Babylon. It's in the Babylonian kingdom. It's right there by the Euphrates. So he calls him out of Babylon, out of that region. And he says, come and show you, I'm going to show you a land and I'm going to build a nation out of you. 
And of course, you know, he has um, 12 grandsons and one of them, his name is Joseph. He ends up with this technicolor dream coat and everything, but he gets sent into exile and he gets lifted up in, into exile. And we talked last week how, how that, that story of Joseph ends up being very similar to the story of Daniel, that you have somebody in exile. And how do you live in exile when they serve other gods and they have different beliefs and a completely different culture? And how do you stay true to, to um, Yahweh God? And, um, and, but he gets lifted up because uh, he, he's a very, um, uh, well, because he, he hasn't bowed, you know, he, he's, uh, he's done things honestly and earnestly and, um, and God's had favor on him, knows that he can trust Joseph and, um, and the king ends up trusting him and um, lifts him up to be uh, a ruler in the land of Egypt. So he rises to prominence in that, that empire. And then of course, we know, know how it goes in Egypt. They're there for 400 years and they become slaves. But of course, Moses um, leads them out of there in the exodus across the Red Sea, always that chaos waters, but uh, you know, like God's people ending up on dry land, which we see that theme over and over again in scripture. And coming out of the promised land, you know, Moses dies, but in goes Joshua, and they start conquering this new place that God has promised them, starting with Jericho. And they conquer and settle in the land, but they don't have a king yet. And so you have a time of the judges. And the judges is a really rough book because it's, uh, it, it deals with um, everybody's pretty much lawless. And they just kind of see, they do what they see fit. And then they, they end up in these cycles where uh, um, their enemies start taking over and, um, and it's part of their judgment, really, because God is uh, um, judging them. And then what he does, though, when they cry out for help is that he sends a, these judges, these, they're usually military leaders, um, uh, to defeat the enemy. So we have the story of Samson and um, Deborah, Jephthah, Gideon, people like that. But... Israel cries out more and more for a king. So we go into the time of the kings. Of course, the first couple of kings are um, King Saul and then King David and then his son Solomon. But after Solomon, you have a split kingdom. There's a rebellion and, um, and a lot of people, Jeroboam drags a lot of people to the north. The only, um, uh, so it gets divided into Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Um, Judah uh, is fake, you know, they, they stay with the king. Um, they, but in, in, in the north, they abandon God altogether, just never even really a good king from then on. So when you look at the book of Kings, uh, the two books of Kings that we have, then there are stories of the kings in Israel and in Judah, and you, you see stories about both of them. What happens is that um, they both stray from God further and further over the years. And what you have is that you have the captivity of both the North and the South. So in the North, they fall to Assyria and they get dragged off to Assyria. In the South, and this happens a bit about 150 years later, they start, they start, um, they fall to Babylonia. They, they fall to the Babylonian empire. And that brings us to where we are um, in the story of Daniel starting um, uh, in, in chapter one. Um, and this book is going to go um, from this period right here, 607 BC, um, to um, the beginning here of the Persian Empire, because, and Daniel is going to be alive during this whole time. He's going to rise to prominence early on in the Babylonian um, exile, and he's going to um, rise again to prominence in the next world empire, so, which is incredible, and he's going to... Um, he's going to rise in prominence in the, in the next empire, which is Persia. So you actually have three deportations of the Jews by Babylon. The first one is in 607 BC, and Daniel's part of this exile right here. Later on, what happens is that Babylon, um, you know, like Israel, they rebel, and then Nebuchadnezzar goes back, and he, he, he shuts down that rebellion. He kind of puts in a uh, a puppet king that he can control 
um, but there's another rebellion and finally um, there's the complete destruction of Jerusalem. So it's not yet at the, at the destruction of the total destruction of Jerusalem, but it is at the, that initial wave of exiles that it's taken, um, uh, taken away. If you look at Second Kings, back basically you can get that whole story from um, Second Kings twenty through 20, um, through chapter twenty five, twenty six around there. <clears throat> but it kind of begins um, here, and it starts with the good king um, Hezekiah. But Hezekiah gets sick, and he and he's told by um, Isaiah, you, you know, you're going to die. You better get ready to die. But he prays to God and says, you know, like I, I want, and he's given 15 more years. And so he does live a bit longer. Um, but here, starting at um, verse 12, it says, at that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon. So um, the son of the king of ba Babylon, he sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. So, it's, uh, you know, they're being all diplomatic and it's like, hey, you know, we heard, heard you weren't sick, you know, like, how, how you doing? Like, uh, let me let me send some of my guys over there, see how you're doing, you know, <laughs> like you can trust that. Right. Mm -hmm. So and Hezekiah welcomed them and he showed them all his treasures, his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's showing off, right? You know, like, oh, yeah, you know. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say? And from where did they come from? And Hezekiah said, they have come from a far country, from Babylon. He said, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. So Hezekiah, you know, so Isaiah's, you know, like doing a big face palm right here. And then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Yeah. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons, He's a king, right? Hezekiah is a king. Some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. That's where that's where Daniel comes in, because he's going to come from this royal line. He's going to be a eunuch in the in the um, in service to Nebuchadnezzar. He was actually made into a eunuch. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Yes, and everything. because your hormones don't go right, your arms get all long and weird and stuff. <laughs> if, if you're young, well, yeah, if you're young, young if you're young enough, yeah. <laughs> but they're like 15 years old, so maybe that happened. <laughs> I never thought about that, but he actually went through that process. No, he went through that process, and and a lot of officials did. Yeah, so, yeah, like, if you were like, uh, if you were that close to the king and his harem and all that kind of stuff. That's what happened, but you're also put in charge and stuff. Man, that's, you know. a whole other level that's a whole story. nother level, yeah. yeah. So then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, why not if there be peace and security in my days? So Hezekiah is kind of like, well, as long as it doesn't happen in my time, right? You know, so, well, Hezekiah was a good king, but here he's kind of like not, you know, it's not, not so cool. You know, you're thinking, well, wow, maybe Hezekiah will do something to restore Israel because he's such a good king, or maybe he's teaching his son right and everything. But there's always those cycles of like, oh, no, now he's gone and done it, you know, and uh, and you, you see cracks in his armor where like he's not that uh, he it's kind of like, well, as long as I'm not part of that, you know, it's like as long as that all happens after me. But we're talking about his grandsons, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's like uh uh, he should be devastated about this, you know, but he's not. At that time, the servants of, okay, so now we're skipping to 2 Kings 24, and we're going to pick up um, right around the time that this happens um, to his, uh, one of his, uh, this is, I think his great, great grandson or something like that. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, because now Nebuchadnezzar is, is uh, king in Babylon, right? Um, came to up to Jerusalem and the city was besieged and Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon came to the city while his servants were besieging it 
and Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon. So he surrendered himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign and carried off all the treasure of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made, as the Lord had foretold. So we have here that it's in his eighth reign that he's taken to Babylon, but it's actually in the third year that he fell in his, in his third year. So there's a five-year period, I, I guess, before he's taken off to Babylon. You'll, you'll probably notice that um, in, in Daniel. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and the smiths. He's basically taken the cream of the crop and anybody who's really going to be really useful to him, right? None remained except the poorest people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon, the king's mother, the king's wives, his officials, the chief men of the land he took into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. And the king of Babylon brought captive to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000, and the craftsmen and the metal workers, 1,000, all of them strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Metanian, Jehoiakim's uncle, uh, king in his uh, palace, in, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. So Zedekiah is, uh, was not his original name. You've probably heard of King Zedekiah. But he's basically putting a, a king in charge, but he's um, going to be under Nebuchadnezzar's thumb. But Zedekiah rebelled eventually against the king of Babylon. And then that's when um, Nebuchadnezzar comes back and he just starts, he just starts um, destroying um, Jerusalem. So here we get to Daniel 1. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Ju Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand and some of the vessels of God, the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and the, placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. So a couple things here. First of all, you notice that um, this word Shinar, right? If you go back to the again to the um, the the Tower of Babel, it was in the shine. It's it's in the plain plain of Shinar, the Shinar plain. Um, again, they build a tower because there's no mountain right there, and so they built what would probably be a ziggurat, and they're going to um, you know uh, try to reach heaven or try to uh, you know, make a high place of their own because there is no natural high place there. But that's in the Shinar plain. So uh, remember that name Shinar because in a lot of prophetic and poetic parts of the Bible, whenever you're talking about Shinar or the Chaldeans, it's Babylon. It's just different nicknames for the uh, for the same place. Um, and so um, I thought I'd point that out now because uh, uh, you're going to, once you see it, then it's one of those things that you see often, but it's talking about Babylon. So he brings these things that belong to the temple and he brings them to the house of his God. So he's going to bring them to his temple and he's going to um, use these um, Israelite um, objects of, you know, uh, religious objects and things that they used in their worship. Um, and he's going to use them in his, um, in his, not just for his treasury, but also as, as um, a form of worship for his God, right? He's going to dedicate those things to his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish and of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. So here you see that uh, he is given to the chief eunuch. If you look in some um, English versions, it'll say chief official, you know, or things like that. But the, the original, sometimes those words are kind of interchangeable. 
it was basically understood in some cultures that if you were an official, you were a eunuch or, you know, whatever. But he brings, um, he brings some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family um, and of nobility. So uh, he's uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they're all kind of, um, they're aristocratic, you know, they're, um, they're part of a dynasty and, um, and nobility and, and royalty. And again, and here again on verse four, it says youths without blemish. There's this thing that you're going to see repeated in um, uh, this, this thing about good appearance. You see that in Esther, you see that in Joseph, right? Um, you know that Joseph is really good looking. That's why Potiphar's wife is trying to hit on him and everything. And, um, and it's kind of a, it, it actually goes with this theme in the Bible that like, that somebody sees what is good and, and takes it. It goes all the way back to Eve. She saw something that's good and takes it. And like David sees Bathsheba, it takes her. And there's a, a there's this theme that gets repeated. And, but there's, um, so like if you go back to Genesis and you look at um, what God makes in the first in creation, he makes, he, he, he makes the waters, he makes the, 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 the stars or whatever, and he sees that it's good, right? He sees that it's good, sees that it's, the word is tov, sees that it's tov, sees that it's tov. Then you get Eve, she sees that it's tov. She sees the fruit and she sees that it's tov, but you know that what she's about to do isn't right. So you're supposed to think about, you know, seeing and and taking as opposed to seeing and doing something else with it. Like um, when, when we remember we were looking at uh, Moses, that his mother saw that he was beautiful, a beautiful child. She sees that he's Tove, but she doesn't take him. What she does is that she puts him in an ark like Noah, you know, and then she places him out in the reeds and leaves uh, and, and puts him in God's hands, basically. That's all the Noah, you know. Yeah, so um, it's there's kind of like a there's sort of a meditation thing that kind of uh, appears and reappears uh, throughout scripture. But anyway, so they're good, they're good of appearance and skillful in all kinds of wisdom. They're very um, uh, and they're competent. They're able to stand in the king's palace. You know, it's not any kind of schmo is going to go in there and work for the king. So. And he wants to teach them all kinds of literature and the language of the Chaldeans. Basically, he's going to teach them the Babylonian way. They have to learn how to be um, top Babylonians, cream of the crop Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Az Azariah. That's um, Daniel that they get later named um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's weird is that in this chapter, they are referred to by their, um, uh, by their Hebrew names. But then for the rest of the book, Daniel's mentioned um, by his Hebrew name. But um, in that, in the fiery furnace story, then all of a sudden it, the Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are mentioned by their um, Babylonian names, which I'm not sure what to make of that yet. I think that, and um, it's part of those stories that are in Aramaic, you know, but um, you have chapter two where they're mentioned that way too. So I'm not sure what to make out of all of that, but I'm just bringing that to your attention, something to chew on. So they get a daily portion of the food that the king ate. So this is all coming like, um, this is all coming into the, the king's palace. And the chief of the unit gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishael, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. Um, there's a little bit of a dispute. Uh, and there's a little bit of differences, I should say, um, between the way that these uh, names are uh, translated. So um, Daniel, God is my judge. And then he gets a new name, meaning Belteshazzar. Bel protects his life. So um, Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious. 
uh, he gets called Shadrach, which means Aku is exalted. Um, it's another Babylonian. God. These are all Babylonian gods. Yeah, Bel and Aku. Mishael is, is who is what God is. It's probably a little bit more like who is like God, but he gets um, turned into who is what Aku is. Um, so there's kind of like a, a, a parallel there. Like who's, who's like Yahweh? And then Meshach is like, who's like Aku, basically. And then Azariah, Yahweh is my help. Um, and his new name means servant of Nebo. So Nebo is another um, one of these Babylon, Babylonian gods. Would that be the same as the Sumerian ones too? Or that's a little different? It's different from Sumerian, yeah. Um, so, um, but then, so they, they get new names, you know, and um, you see that with Esther. Esther's, uh, that's not her original name. And then Joseph, his name gets changed. And they're just going to be assimilated into the culture. They're going to wear Babylonian clothes. The, so one of the, the things that you're supposed to be thinking at this point is, yeah, in a way, it's, it's expected that it, it, you have to simulate. You have to adjust your life to Babylon because you live in Babylon. We do the same thing here. But at what point are you going to say no? You know, so it's surprising that like, in a way that like, well, what are they going to do with their new names? And, and I don't think some people, you know, like uh, commentators are going to emphasize that they have to be stripped of their Jewish identity in a sense. And it's like, no, this is your new culture. This is your new, and we're going to change your name. And, uh, but at the same time, the names that they're given, it's an insult to them, but it's, but it's a compliment from um, like Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians point of view, because they're like, you know, Bell protects his life. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost like a, in their culture, they're, their culture, they're, they're good names to have probably, you know, uh, you know, Aku's, you know, who's like, right. Servant of Nebo is probably not like a derogatory thing. They're not given derogatory names because they're given uh, exalted positions in the country and they're, they're privileged, you know, out of the people that could be there. So, but that makes it more difficult in a sense, because like, if you've got people who are insulting you, then you want to fight back and you're going, and it's, it's easy for you to like, uh, easier for you to go like, no, uh, you know, forget them. And I'm going to, you know, do this. But what if, what if you're given um, real privilege in a society that is against God, you know, and that's kind of like, um, they're going to have to face um, things where everything is against them, but their integrity has to make, remain intact in spite of the fact that they're being exalted and that they're oh, being, in yeah, it's like, man, you, you, yeah, that's a great example. You, you made it big in Hollywood, you know, and, um, or you made it big in politics or something else, but, you know, like you're, you're having to deal with um, uh, maintaining your integrity in that environment and everybody looks up to you and you've got a reputation now to uphold um and those sorts of things and boy these people have been so nice to me um what do i do you know um so so it's both extremes uh it's gonna you're gonna see both extremes in their life you know and i think that in many ways this is harder you know like bell protect his life you know um but daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food you know king can boy that's a cultural thing i mean you know cultures where it's kind of like you refuse their food and that's an insult you know let alone a king and you're you're given the best of the best you know like this is expensive stuff you're not going to eat it you know like what's wrong with you you know um and we're or with the wine that he drank now you got to be thinking well they're allowed to drink wine right and they can eat some of the food i mean what what's going to be wrong with that and i think what we're looking at is that generally the food that's been um brought to the palace and that that they have um you know that it's it's not just like part of the taxes it's actually food that has been um dedicated to their gods you know offered so that's offered to idols exactly and um and kind of like what um, 
Paul had had been talking about. And it we don't know if you know Daniel and and his friends would have been um, condemned for doing that, you know. But it just says here, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. You know, he's like, I'm not going to do that. He's going to he's going to take something and he's going to set himself apart um, with that. Um, here's something that I kind of like noticed recently that in, in the law, in Leviticus, when when um, the Israelites had their um, if they were going to have an animal to eat a lamb that they were going to slaughter they were not allowed to just slaughter it and eat it. In fact, um, in Leviticus, I think it's 17, it says, if you do that, you'll be guilty of bloodshed, like you just murdered an animal uh, because you, you know, and um, it has to be dedicated to the Lord as a peace offering first, and then you can, you can, can enjoy it. So everything, the, the meat that they ate was dedicated to the Lord. That was, yeah. Yeah, that was at least while they were in that camp. I don't know how that worked when they once they were in the, the promised land, but in a, there was a sense that there that um, if you did that, then you had to sanctify it. And um, and it's kind of like in the context of God is giving you this life, um, but the the blood is don't eat the blood because the blood is the life you um you sacrifice that's the life that goes into the tent that's the, the the sprinkling of the blood and the and the thing that that cleanses you you know i'm i'm going to give you a life everything was modeled in uh, after i'm going to i'm going to provide a life for you that's going to um sanctify you mm -hmm. um and it's all a model of christ you know but um but you don't own that life um but i will give it to you for for those purposes so you don't know if it is in all the old testament but at least in that area yeah all animal consumption was like dedicated to god for well yeah at least from the levitical law on i don't uh, I, there wasn't anything up until that point that i can think of. of i don't know what that process would entail but that's a lot of yeah you would you would to god if people would have to eat meat every couple of days probably. well yeah they probably didn't eat it that often especially not out in the desert but if you're like i'm gonna throw a party and, I'm, and me and my neighbors we were gonna eat like a lamb and have a feast you couldn't just go out and slaughter it that's unlawful whether you did it in in the camp or outside of the camp um and the other reason of course is that it would be prevent people from um sacrificing an animal to another god because they still had that temptation you know, um, so there's there's a lot more weight to Daniel just saying, you know, I'm not going to those cultures. It was kind of like that. So you you had Daniel saying, you know, like I, I, he can't even drink the wine, you know. And so it's probably um, uh, the assumption is, is that like it's probably food and wine that's been offered to um, to the idols. Um. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. He says, you know, can I get permission not to do this? And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord, my king, who assigned your food and your drink. The Nebuchadnezzar assigned this, okay? I, I, he's having a problem with this. Um, for why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are your own ages. Um, so you would endanger my head with the king. If, if, if you guys don't look, um, if you guys don't look good after a while or something like that, um, he's going to cut my head off. Okay. Cause I'm in charge. And, um, and then I screwed up because I didn't make you do it. Right. So um, now here's something that like I hadn't noticed before that um, they actually Daniel goes to the steward of the chief of the eunuchs. So he doesn't go to the chief of the eunuchs. It doesn't sound like the chief of the eunuchs wants to do this at all, right? But he goes to the, the guy who's right over him, which is the steward. And, um, and he says, test your servant for 10 days. Lest, let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. That's apparently neutral ground and maybe they didn't sacrifice vegetables. Um, or, or water, why would you, you know, do that? So you just, just give us veggies and water, you know, and all the vegans are like, yay, you know. Uh, then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. 
and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he's like, put us to the test after 10 days, you know, and, and compare us to everybody else. So the steward, he listened to them on this matter and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were in better appearance and fatter of flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So they had, they had put on, they had put on more weight than, than, than the other guys, you know, fat, fatter of flesh. They, they looked like they'd been living in luxury, you know, like eating salads and, uh, um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and they, and they looked healthy and they were like better in appearance. So they looked great, you know, so the steward took away their food and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. This whole all literature and wisdom, this tells me something here that they learned Babylonian literature not just as outsiders, but they knew it better than their peers who were from Babylon. Wait, why did you? Because it says in wisdom. Yeah, all literature and wisdom. In other words, they were supposed to know all kinds of literature and wisdom. And of course, this is going to come from the Babylonians and some of the surrounding communities. You know, maybe they've got some Egyptian literature or whatever. Who knows, you know, what they have. But, um, but it's kind of like if, if God has given you a gift of, you know, science, say you're scientific minded and you're a Christian and you know what science is like as far as, you know, the, that community's non-belief in God. It's not, um, it's probably not for you to be set to say, hey, even though I've been gifted in science, I'm going to get away from this because this community is so anti-God. It's up to you to not know it, not just know it, including evolution or whatever else that you have an objection with, but to know it better. You know, um, it's kind of like uh, um, they knew the literature and I can guarantee you there's literature that is saying things that they don't believe in. OK, but they know that they know the literature and they and they and they're wise about it. And they and there is things that are things in that literature which made them wise that were good. It's not like uh, they, they know that the that that um, the, the Torah and that, that, that scripture is God's word, but there is also genuine wisdom in some of this uh, other literature, but they also know how to filter it. And, um, and that's part of the process that, the, that they have undergone because you can tell at the end of the day, they're still going to be dedicated to Yahweh in their hearts. So, and then Daniel just had this gift of understanding all kinds of visions and dreams, you know, um, not everybody gets to be a dream interpreter. So he, he gets to be kind of like Joseph, you know, like where he can interpret dreams. Verse 18, at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in before the chief of the eunuchs before them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king spoke with them and among all of them was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they, they stood before the king. They got these positions. They got the gig. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters, which were all of his kingdom, that, that were in all of his kingdom. I'm going to get to these words here in a second. Um, and Daniel was there until the first year, this thing, until the first year of the king of King Cyrus, which is all the way in the Persian Empire. A couple things here. You know the story of the Magi, right? The story of the Magi. The, uh, yeah, the three wise men who are probably not just three, but, you know, the, the wise men. The Bible doesn't say three. But, oh, it doesn't. No, it doesn't say that. That's a Christian tradition. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of our traditions, but it's not in the Bible. Um, the Magi, the word Magi is where we get the word magicians from. Okay, it's also where we get magistrates from, um, and which is more of like a political position, right? Yeah, yeah, some kind of politicians. What these guys are is that they're they're kind of a political class, but they're also part of like kind of like an occult class or a 
um, the uh, magistrates, judges. Yeah, they 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 judge on matters. Okay, yeah. The, so they have, but you know, they they still have a function that's beyond, like, say, priestly. So these guys are are kind of like priests, kind of a priestly class. They're also kind of like a ruling class. They they make decisions and they they um uh, they they are there in service. Um, the the model that's kind of being used is that if you were a ruler, a king, um, you were a image of the gods, or you were an image of the god who you um, uh, worship, right? That you are you represent that god. Now there has to be this, the, in their view, the, there had to be that connection between heaven and earth. That's, that's not just um, Israelite theology. That's, that's pagan theology too. That's, that's why, that's why they made a, uh, you know, the tower of Babel, you know, this, this trying to connect heaven and earth. All right. Um, and as a King, your kingdom was going to go as well as your communication with the gods. Okay, so um, you were if if things were going poorly in the kingdom, you either fell out of favor with the gods or something, you know. I kind of treated Joe like you must have done something bad. That yeah, the, the gods are angry, or this god's angry, or whatever, you know. Yeah. So, um, so the idea was that um, kings would surround themselves with the priestly class, um, people that he thought might help him have better communication with the gods. So the, these are not just, they're, they're wise men, um, but they're also kind of like a priestly class. They're, they're like, um, they're kind of like for him to, um, you know, uh, keep that open and, and, and have things go well in his kingdom. Like you, he's got, he's got yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so what he's going to notice, so the whole thing between wisdom and ability to, to, um, to know science and this other stuff and you know it's all kind of like one big package is that that's what they're looking at in Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego but everybody who was like um, uh, like part of that society now Nebuchadnezzar had inherited these guys from his father that that whole society right and that got passed on into the into the next empire so like, just like he took all the cream of the crop from Israel and he did that from other countries or whatever, when, when uh, the Medes and Persians came in and they defeated Babylon, they took all the wise men and all that kind of stuff for their own, um, their own empire, right? Yeah. Now that went on and on and on all the way until the time of Christ, which is why you have Magi from the East from the remnants of that, uh, from, from the, uh, it, they're kind of like a remnant of the, you know, the Babylonian go empire going into that Persian empire. They're coming from that Persian region. The Magi had their roots in this society right here. In fact, there's so much of connection there. There's enough of a connection there that some people have speculated that one of the reasons the wise men knew to go to Jerusalem and, and in their research, when they saw the star, they're like, what does this mean? What does this mean? You know, they knew to go to Jerusalem. They knew something was up in Jerusalem and they knew it was going to be about a king. They knew so much information, right? Where did they get that from? Could it be from Daniel? He had, had the, it could come from Isaiah who had, you know, like, uh, so he, uh, um, so it's it's speculation we we don't know but it's a possibility you know that because they they do seem to know a heck of a lot um so anyway so let's just do a couple of quick comparisons and we'll uh close close this um let's go back to joseph okay if you look at genesis 4, uh, 41 pharaoh called jace joseph's name zephanah Paneah, and nobody can decide really what this means so I, I don't i don't know what it means I mean, everybody disagrees and then he gave him in marriage asenath the daughter of potiphera priest of on isn't that crazy he marries into the priestly class there the um uh joseph does right later on it gets called hylopolis the city of the sun 
basically the priest of Bone was the, the high priest of the sun god, um, Ra. And um, he led worship to the sun god, Ra. So Joseph went out over the, the land of Egypt. And I, I saw somebody wrote this in, on, on Got Questions. It says, the ancient historian Herodotus reported that the men of Hylopolis Hilo are said to be the most learned in the records of the Egyptians. Um, history, two, three, translated by whatever. Um, the high priest in own held the title, the greatest of seers. When Joseph married into this family, he joined a social class befitting a national leader. Also implied in the marriage arrangement was Pharaoh's confidence that Joseph too was a seer or a prophet of the highest caliber. So you see that um, because of what um, Joseph did and, and was able to do because of God giving him, giving him that is that he is lifted up to a position, but it's in that it's in, in that priestly class. It's almost so, like they viewed like someone with a skill, like Joseph had a skill to manage the food and all that. Yeah, it was almost like even Pharaoh saw it as it was from God. Yeah, they almost yeah. recognized gifts as being like if you're good at something that was like yeah. spiritual. And now, obviously, I'm not saying that if you had a if 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 God's like giving you like. Uh, somebody sees like, wow, you know, like uh, you, you, you gave me a good word here. Let, um, let's exalt you in this like occult thing, mm -hmm. you know, don't do it. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's not, that's not, um, uh, you're talking about like a different, um, you're talking about a different time and you, you still have to wonder like what happens, um, you know, what happens if you get into that situation, you know, so like for Joseph and for um, our four friends here, is that whenever they were able to, um, whenever God used them to show his power and that like, no, I'm the one who interprets dreams and I can even tell you what you dream, you know, that um, God brings glory to himself. So God has a design in all of this, you know, and um, later on, we, we find out like little pieces of information in, in uh uh, coming out of Egypt, that there were a number of Egyptians who who went along with Israel because they believed in Yahweh. You know, they were convinced by, um, you know, so the word, the, you know, Yahweh's word had gone out into um, into Egypt and it went out into Babylon, and um, God showed Himself strong uh, on behalf of those who served Him in both those places. Um, they were folks. Uh, so. Yeah, go ahead. Well, they were kind of culturally, the Egyptians and the Babylonians were probably more open-minded to just adding another god into their pantheon, where as the Hebrew, the yeah. Israelites, they only served one god, but the Egyptians, it was probably like, okay, we can also have another god. Is right. it kind of like, yeah, the, the more gods, the better, because yeah. we cover all our bases? Uh, well, what, what, they're, what they're seeing and what kind of has to be shown from the start even to the Israelites, is that there's no other God like Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is distinguishing himself from these other gods or these other so-called gods, you know. Um, but he's not, um, uh, but he's doing it in a way that you kind of like, that makes you think, you know. Um, so there's, there's, there's some food for thought here, like what, what do you do? So the whole story is set up, you know, like what do you do with that tension? You're living in Babylon. You're living in Egypt. You're even in prominence. Um, God has got a plan. Um, your job is that you've got to be, um, you've got to be faithful to Yahweh no matter what and be willing to give your life for it. At the same time, he can move you into positions that are um, culturally um, exalted um, but he, what are you going to do with that? You know, because some people would, um, some people would have gotten, it would have gotten to their head and they would have been, well, I'm a hotshot now in Egypt. I'm a hotshot now in Babylon and become more and more Babylonian in their, in their outlook and, and all that. And, um, and, and what we see in these stories is that no, they didn't. You know, At least these four didn't, these, these four didn't, and neither did Joseph. So, I wonder how many other young men from the Israel, did. yeah, yeah, right. It's you know, there, there was a whole bunch of them, there's a whole group of them. So, 
they they the, were probably not being told about a bunch of stories of, of uh, other young Jewish lads that went in there and just became full on Babylonian and just did whatever, you know. So here in Esther 2, we see some um, Mordecai was bringing up Hadassah. Again, Esther is not her real name. It's um, it's uh, Esther is is uh, is related to the our Ishtar, the god Ishtar. It's also where where we get our e Easter from. Yeah, Easter like from the Ishtar. When was the Esther in a timeline compared to Daniel. Oh, okay. I'll I'll go back and show you. It's and it's. Yeah, yeah, I'll go back to that slide. This is the last slide I think I have here. I'll go back and spend. Uh, yeah, so um, <laughs> Esther, the, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. There again, you know, like that, that like she's Tove and she's going to get taken, right? Mm -hmm. And when her father and mother died, Mordecai took her in his, his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when men, young, many young women were gathered in the Susa, the citadel, the citadel and Susa, this is going to come up in Daniel 8. Daniel's actually going to have a vision of the Susa in the citadel hundreds of years before, or uh, hundred some odd years before. In the custody of Haggai, Esther was also taken into the king's palace, put into the custody of Haggai, and um, and who had charge of the women and the young woman pleased him and won his favor. So again, it's um, you see favor on these people's lives even earlier, you know, like first they get favor with somebody, you know, who's in charge of them, just like Joseph does with the jailer, you know, even if it starts way down there um, and they're all in exile, they win favor and then they, they get promoted and they get promoted to the top, you know, and he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food. Again, so she gets part of like a royal treatment of food, but she's never recorded as refusing any. So, you know, um, not always is it, you know, um, the same thing. It's not uh, all cookie cutter, you know, it always cut your situation always call, calls for wisdom. Um, the Bible can give you things that to chew on, think about, but it's not always like, clear cut, you know, your, your, these situations are always different from each other. So like, let's, let's actually go back here. Um, oh, yeah, let me see if I, I'm going to go, have to go all the way through the slideshow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Here's where Daniel's at. Here's where we at. Okay. Then later on in his life, you know, uh, Babylon gets conquered completely. Even the second day of deportation, Babylon pretty much gets leveled. Daniel's alive through this whole time going into Persia. And this is like around the time when he goes, gets thrown into the lion's den, right? 540 BC. So this is uh, um, close to, and then here is Xerxes. So Xerxes is the, the king that, um, that um, Esther gets, uh, gets married. Uh, so I guess Esther arrives in Susa in, in, in the harem in 480 BC. So about five years later. So it's about um, 120 years, you know, 120 years um, from the time Daniel is um, deported to Babylon to where Esther becomes queen. And then after Nebuchadnezzar, what was it to the kings of Babylon that were when Daniel was in, in there? I'm sorry, what? The kings of Babylon that were there when Daniel was in there was uh, like the son. And then um, yeah, I think there was somebody in, be in between. Then there's Belshazzar. Belshazzar is the one who we're going to see gets the writing on the wall. And then was he the last one? He was the Daniel last one before the Medes and Persians oh, okay. came. Yeah, so the writing on the wall was Daniel says, Basically, this very night, you're going to be defeated. You're done, bro. You're done, bro. Um, I think he was more like a vice regent. Um, but, um, you know. It's interesting when you put all that into, like, a timeline, you know? Like, cause, yeah. Because all that in the Bible is not chronological necessarily. So it's easy. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, Daniel's not in chronological order. But um, but you can already tell, like, if you're talking about, like, the, the per 
you know, he's, he's saying tonight is when the Persians are going to take over. And many, many take all you Parson or whatever, you know, even days of numbered and all that. That happens right at the, uh, right, right at the defeat of um, Babylon. And then, and then Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den under the next Persian king. Oh. Yeah. So he writes, so he, and then when he gets out of the lion's den, then he's r- risen to prominence again. So Daniel is, rises to prominence in the, in two of the world empires, you know, quite a life, you know, like when he's 15 years old and then some years later, or like when he's in his late teens, then he, he gets risen to prominence. And then, uh, and then when he's an old man, he gets, he gets dragged back out of retirement. Maybe he can uh, interpret this dream and he, and then he gets, uh, and he gets taken up by the next, um, um, world leader. And, um, gets tested again in the lion's den as an old man, you know, but, um, uh, yeah, quite a life. So we'll start with some of the fun stuff and the prophecy weird stuff next week, you know, Daniel too. (laughs) That's why you guys are all here. It's for like all the, you know, like, how are you going to interpret that? You know, come on, Mark. Yeah. (laughs) But, uh, um, yeah so i think we got off to a good start but especially like uh, if you missed it look at last week's the the um because babylon as a um as an archetype is uh, what you're seeing is not just an historical account of what happens with daniel it's also especially through the visions you're seeing what babylon means um in terms of um, the biblical, the whole biblical narrative, going all the way to um, you know mystery Babylon in in the book of Revelation, and you're going to see that um, surprise, surprise, one city that gets painted as Babylon in particular in the New Testament is Jerusalem, and the whole Jerusalem system that gets painted as Babylon, and the same kind of language that's used to uh, in judgment of Babylon, um, in Ezekiel, that language starts getting used, um, um, for Jerusalem, you know, so it's, it's a sobering thing. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, so Babylon's a big deal. Any questions, comments, observations, raised hands? Sure, he usually has a raised hand. That was very good. Yeah, I like that history stuff. Yeah, I hope it helped that it, you know, like kind of like gives you a, a picture of like when all this happened. You know, this uh, kind of gives you, a, a, you know, like a, a feel for what's going on at the time. I like you know. too, because I think a lot of people in the secular world, they think of the Bible as not connected to real history. Right. Well, like, and like, I love that, like, Xerxes, who is in the Hollywood movies. Yeah, 300, also, right. Is also in the Bible. And like, so to see the timelines and like what I've studied even outside of the church about the Babylon, Babylonian Empire, and it's tying in with, I don't know, it's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's like confirmation in a lot of it. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and what we're going to see is that um, Daniel starts um, having visions about the next empires, the Greek Empire. I mean, uh, the, he starts having visions about the, um, the, the Persian Empire. He starts having um, uh, uh, visions about the Greek Empire. He starts having uh, what's arguably the Roman Empire. Um, and so bringing you all the way to, up to the time of Christ. And some of it is so uncanny that um, a lot of critics of Daniel will say it must have been written after those events happened. Was um, right the only problem with that is that it was already translated from Hebrew and Aramaic into Greek in the Septuagint hundreds of years before those events took place. So okay. it doesn't really even make, um, uh, um, doesn't really hold water, you know, to criticize it that way. So in order for it to be part of the Septuagint, right, which was what, like around the 300s BC? Um, then, um, 
it would have already had to been enough circulation to be esteemed enough that like, let's put this in the Septuagint and copy it and put it into the Septuagint. So it can't just have been like written right before the Septuagint either, you know, it had to have been written well before. You know? So yeah, we'll, we'll see a lot of that coming, but a lot of it is, um, is relevant to us and not probably in ways that you're going to expect, at least not the way that I will interpret it or not interpret it, I think, you know, so we'll see. <clears throat> Sheree, uh, go ahead. Sheree, you got a raised hand. Well, since you called me out, I thought I should do my duty and uh, <laughs> the graphics, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Those are some good graphics, Mark. Uh, <laughs> Google search images. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate them, though. All that work yeah. that you did, I appreciate it. It's just a little Google here and there. Thanks. What's the translation where it interprets the Hebrew Bible as or that he says that he feels why he wasn't free, or that he didn't see him wasn't free. That is in chapter nine. He's oh, okay. going to, he yeah. Yeah, and it's actually an interesting thing to bring up because, okay, he's only eating, he's only water and vegetables. So like when he, what some people call a Dan, the Daniel fast, right? No pleasant <laughs> food. Like it's like, you know, well, yeah, he's just eating. <laughs> <laughs> he's just eating british pub food or what you know yeah, no nah, he uh, well the thing is is that like i'm going i'm like well what's left to him yeah. you know it's like he, all he's eating is vegetables and water so like if he's like no i eat no pleasant food i'm like well what's he's what's he narrow it down to yeah that's so like you relative know? too because you know i'm like you can cook eggplant <laughs> with some salt and garlic and olive oil on it and it tastes good right like, is he having bread yeah. like dipped in olive oil with like I don't know, like, yeah. on it, like or or did he have a source um, by that time where like he could get some l legitimate food without having to get it straight from the king and not offered to idols or I mean, he's eating French fries you and know. Ketchup and, like... and by the I way, it's not a yeah. Go ahead. I think it was chia seeds. Chia seeds. <laughs> he probably he probably went from like some pretty good vegetables down to kale or something. You know, it's like but okay. Not, Baby kale. <laughs> yeah, I like kale. That kale was good. Yeah, full on, full on adult kale and the stems is what he was eating. Oh, only the stems. I, 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 yeah, only the stems. I don't, I don't know. People call it a Daniel fast. It's not a fast. Fast is where you don't eat. Um, <clears throat> well, you so, be but fasting from certain things like <coughs> nah, fasting. Fast. Fasting is where you don't eat. I, I kind of don't like that. I don't like the whole thing where we're like, oh, I'm on a Daniel fast. I'm not, I'm not on Facebook or whatever. I'm fasting from, I'm fasting from Instagram. It's like, oh, well, it's not a fast, you know, I don't know. You're abstaining from something. Fair enough, you know, but it's not, but there's, there's a, it's a, it's a pet peeve of Rachel and mine, you know, like, well, oh, fast, I'm going to fast this. Yeah, my heart, my heart. <laughs> it's like, I'm still going to eat what I want. <laughs> it's a, what'd you say? An argument is coming. I mean, like, I don't know what this definition got. It's very good. You got to say it's from all or certain types of foods and drinks. Oh, really? But that's. Okay. Oh, that's oh, okay the, the, the dictionary adapted it to our modern you know like see but like like arabs and muslims well that's that no they don't they, they don't eat anything but, um yeah but like it's sunrise. probably like like oh we're fasting for this whole month well yeah then but you pick out every night yeah yeah, yeah. Like yeah. well during the during the day they fast or whatever you know set a time fasting is this whole other you know like a uh, can of worms uh in scripture no nobody you know uh i don't know we we've we've mo i think we modernized our, our idea of fasting you know to um for something that i i, I very rarely see anybody nowadays fasting in, um, for for purpose purposes of repentance or uh, or mourning you know? 
But that's like but, the people that say like, oh, I'm sober. I only drink like one glass of wine a day. And I'm like, I wouldn't say you're sober, man. I mean, yeah. I guess you're not drunk. Yeah, so I don't do any drugs. I don't do any drugs. I only smoke weed. Oh, it's not a real drug. So do you see how Let's do a Bible study fast. <laughs> the Bible study. Yeah, let's do a Bible study on fasting. I mean, to me, it's like. Uh, I'd be the biggest hypocrite. You're like, I'm going to not have to see this for a month, God. I mean, just an abstention or something. What would you call it? An abstaining? I'm abstaining from tortillas? Or I'm uh, from it's a diet. Well, everything's a diet. Yeah. Well, he did, you know, he, he was like, uh, I don't know, maybe he was too frail to, you know, um, full on fast on something. So he's like, I'm going to do something and um, give up something fleshly, you know, so I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, look, at, if you if you're interested about what fasting is, look, look at when people fasted in the Bible. I really do. And it's and it's. There is there is a, a there is a difference between what you see and what you see nowadays typically. So a we don't fast when we're in mourning. Usually, uh, that's usually a way to show distress. You know, like um, you know, like that you you're like somebody a diet some you know, you, you put on sackcloth and ashes and and you letting everybody not, you're, know that you're mourning and you won't eat anything. And then the other thing is repentance. People, you know, repentance. People were repented in, in, in fasting. You know, like uh, the whole city of Nineveh, they fasted and they even made their cows fast. You know, it's like, no, and then none of their farm animals were eating. It's like, no, God have mercy on us. And like, uh, you're going to destroy us? No, please don't. And they, they all fasted. It's like, we're sorry, we're sorry. So it's, uh, um, you know, like... Uh, um it's, it was a, a showing that you know you're serious about repenting uh, mm -hmm. something now i think probably it, um some different aspects got added to it in the new testament and um people were um you know maybe setting themselves aside um kind of like i think daniel was doing something like that where you know like i'm i'm setting this thing aside and i'm setting these things aside for this amount of time because i'm i'm seeking god and i just want to um and i think that day daniel in a sense was mourning because he's like isn't it time to go home god and um please show me what's going on because now we're just under the thumb of the next empire um is is this 70 years up and um and in a way it was but but god was also showing him you know, it's not just 70 years we're talking about. It's 70 times 70 years um, uh, that are set aside for um, your people and Israel. So, yeah, they did go back and they did um, uh, um, rebuild Jerusalem, those things. But they, they were also realizing we're still in exile. And that 490 years where it brings you up to is basically, um, you know, the, the time of Christ and everything. You know, so yeah, there, there's some things to unpack there, and um, different approaches that you could take with that. Well, guys, anybody else have a question? Um, anything? Yeah. Any rabbit? Oh, yeah, go ahead. In the beginning, when you were mentioning the names and kind of like the contrast in between them, that that like made me think of. Uh, the revelations class and how like everything that the devil makes I know like the mark of Jesus and everything like that. It's mm. like a mockery of what like Christ is like the version of what yeah. Um, exactly. And it wasn't like intentional to like maybe to be like, okay, cool, let's just like show the let's just like perverse this or anything like right. that. But that constant like like mockery of it even more to add like a little bit of like, it is a mockery. Yeah. And it's an imitation. It's it's becomes a mockery i don't think that they i don't think in that case in the case of their names that it was a, an intent i don't know how much right. of an intentional mockery it is right. but like from yeah daniel and Ben's point of view is like yeah this is um insulting to yahweh and as his holy people it's you know 
they you they really had to feel like they were in exile at that point. Right. You know. Yeah. yeah. And even for the fact that like we have like the revelation for Mary talking about um, the martyrs were like were like crying out to God like when we actually were like redeem us when we actually yeah. redeem us. And uh, yeah, so the full number of your brothers going to come in first, you know, and yeah, wait a little while, you know. But heaven's concerned. Heaven's concerned about us, you know. Um, and uh, uh, but but the whole thing, if you think about it, like even when I was talking about the uh, Nebuchadnezzar being, you know, in their point of view, that like how it goes on earth is my connection to the gods or heaven or whatever. Um, it's an imitation of um, God and man. Right. Yahweh and man, right? Yeah. You know, that we're made in the image of God, that we were set to rule. And how things are going to go is based on our connection to heaven, so to speak. You know, right. it's like ruling with Christ or ruling with God, as opposed to ruling on the ideas of man or on the ideas of not God or, you know, that's what Babylon is. And, um, and uh, um, so, it, you know, like in any pagan religion that you looked at, like in the, in the ancient Near East, had those imitations of the real thing. But because it's, it's an imitation and not the real thing, it is a mockery. The, the whole pagan system has a, an overlap with, with the reality that you see in scripture. But it, but it was a distorted reality. And um, that's why, like, um, that's why I bring those things up sometimes is because I want to, uh, you know, it, it's cool. It's good to see that so similarities so that you can also notice the differences. You know, that's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of the, those types of things. Anybody else? I kind of had this impression over the last couple of years that like, we try to think of some things as neutral. And I think sometimes consciously things are neutral, but they're either for God or against God, you know? Like, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like even if, you know, people's hearts aren't to be tested necessarily evil, if you're not doing the true form of the worship of God or whatever it is, it is a mockery if it's not the real thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even, if, even if you're not trying to, purposely consciously do that it still is like it's either for god or against god in a way you know right well, you know we're not really dealing with a pagan culture um the the same way that we uh, that they did in you know like thousands of years ago but what we have is ideology and ideology is a cheap substitute for um uh, you know, devotion to God and, you know, those things. It's like ideology takes what, what you, you know, it's kind of like saying it's the difference between say, um, you know, like uh, it's the redefining of good and evil. It's like, mm -hmm. but, but why would you do that? You know, it's like, why are you going to do all of this? Uh, what um, uh, virtue signaling and, and this is great. And this is, you know, and, and and talk about all these things that like that actually come from scripture um, and then pervert them away from the Bible and then replace it with ideology. You know, ideology is the new paganism. And really yeah. the new pagan God is man. Yeah. Like that's who, yeah. I mean, that's who it, our culture worships is ourselves. It's yeah. Ourselves. And, it, and it goes and. In fact, the gods aren't even mentioned in um, uh, the Tower of Babel story. It was man making a name for himself, right? Yeah. I mean, you you could um, uh, uh, you could look at that as like possibly some kind of a, a humanistic endeavor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, humanism at its uh, most boastful. You know, we are going to do this. You know, like like that that Parliament building in in Europe. You know, yeah. like what one. Uh, you know, many languages or many tongues and one, but one um, voice or something like that, you know, and you're like, even our own from anyone, but I mean, I think it's, um, I guess not on our money, which means from anyone. 
Uh, the blurb is, who knows? Yeah, it's it something, could be. Yeah, it's something about it. Which, that's cool, is that's like the definition of America. Like, we're not one race, it's from any one, but that's what it means. Hmm. There he is, I'll be for it. Yeah, don't don't put a uh, don't put American ideology, you know, like as as up there as something to, to necessarily be exalted either, you know. This is out of many. Out of many one, yeah. Oh, where is that? We never went. Oh, for one, have on our money the dollar bill, new world, new order too. It's kind of interesting. Oh yeah, there's right next to the the I also. <laughs> Tower of Babel was a ziggurat which people usually made for not um, for them. Uh, it's for the gods to make the gods come down to them. Oh, that's you know? Yeah, it's uh, um, I, at least according to John Walton, you know, ziggurat, you built a ziggurat because you were going to make the gods come to you or something like that. You know, it's like on your terms, sort of, you know. Um, <laughs> it's about aspect ratio. Like, <laughs> I need to have a hundred percent aspect ratio. You should walk around with a monocle, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Peanut. <laughs> no, no. Gary's laughing because he's probably seen you know, Aaron yeah, stick it up his eye. Yeah, the planner's Peanut. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, guys, um, I think, well, I'm going to stop recording.